All right. Um, we're going to talk about, obviously, about blocks today. I was going to choose not to work for me. All right, we talk about what is a blog. Generally, when we look at what is a blog, we're going to talk about it's a website that kind of the difference between a blog and a regular website is that it's a website that is going to allow you to have regular posts. And so you're going to update it on a frequent basis. A true blog is going to let people respond to your posts. And so it's kind of a discussion board forum avenue um, that you're going to be looking at. Um, blogs now have, have privacy settings or settings where you can create a blog and you're not, you can say no, no posts. Generally, the effectiveness of your blog gets diminished then because it doesn't give people a reason to, to be there, quite honestly, to, to file the collection of conversation that's going to come off of it. When we talk about the different characteristics of a blog, number one, we're going to be looking at the efficient setup. It takes 10 to 15 minutes for you to get it uh, to set up. Um, it should be easy to locate. And so we talk about easy to locate. You should have some form of RSS feeds tied into it, which is going to send information to what we call SEO or search engine optimization. So when someone's looking up a specific topic, you want to make sure that you've got your blog set up, that hopefully you're going to show up on the search engine under that topic. What is the purpose of your blog? Do you have a purpose? And so when you set up the blog, if you want to have readers, the challenge you're going to run into is truly identifying what is the, the purpose that is bringing people to the blog. And so a lot of times, we make sure we've got a specific niche that we're going after. Um, the more general a blog is, the less effective you're going to be, especially when you're first kind of getting started. Uh, we talked a little bit about this before. It's a traffic jam. Um, 2006, we looked at having 26 million blogs in 2011. Um, the report that I saw online today said there was 181 million blogs. And so there's a lot of blogs out there. How many are actually being maintained on a regular basis? That's a different statistic uh, we'll talk about later. But that's how many that are getting created at some point. Now, and again, some of these blogs could be, you know, some 10-year-old starting a blog. You know, it's, it's a wide variety of people that are participating. Setting up the blog generally is going to be the easiest part. Uh, you're going to look at 10 to 15 minutes. You can have your own domain. And so you can have it set up where you could go to a domain service like GoDaddy.com and you can have your own domain with GoDaddy and have that blog feed to that domain name. And so what we're seeing now, we're seeing a lot of companies taking their corporate websites and give it a blog feel. Uh, just because the thing that's nice about the blogs and why companies are saying, hey, Mike, this is a way for me to set my website up, the long net format, it's quick fast communication and so a lot of times what you can do for like blog posts you can put a you know two or three sentences click here to go into further detail to see that article or that post people want quick short pieces of information and so companies are saying this is the new way for us to communicate and to make our, our sites follow that same process of that same kind of information piece Ultimately, if we're going to do this for a company, we need to identify what are the marketing benefits to having a blog. Obviously, one of those benefits should be communicating with our customer or potential customers. How is it that we are going to communicate with our customers. 
we're seeing a lot more companies have internal blog departments where they're having their staff blogging about different topics. And so instead of having a link on your website that someone couldn't find, they're using the blog format to reach a different target base. Um, you know, the one that we showed in the classroom was the Quicken Loans uh, piece where they had like 25 or 30 people that were blogging about mortgages. Not a topic that you would typically think about having a blog on. Uh, it can potentially increase your word of mouth traffic. One major piece, it allows you to receive feedback in ways that you wouldn't receive it before. Uh, how do we get feedback from customers in more traditional settings? All right. Um, I'm going to think from a retail based experience. Customers could give you feedback by going to your customer service area. Um, what's the challenges with that? Now, the big challenge you run into is those people that are going to the customer service desk aren't happy. Right? They're just angry. They're just angry about something. And so you're only getting feedback on what could have been mistakes or bad experiences. Um, when we go to a retail establishment, how many times... When we check out, the person circles the thing on the bottom of the receipt. You can take this survey, and you could have your chance to win $50 or whatever it is, a gift certificate, whatever it is. Um, I'm guessing that those, the success rate on people actually filling out those surveys is probably pretty low. And, I mean, how many of you really go out of your way to say, oh, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to fill out the survey and pick it set? Okay, so maybe if you knew the person, or I, I'll do it like if I got really good service from somebody, or if I kind of like sarcastically harassed that employee during my checkout experience, I'll guilt myself into it. Um, but for the most part, typical experience, boom, that receipt goes in my pocket. That's a grocery store experience. I don't even know why I put the grocery store receipt in my pocket after I check out. Because I've done it before where I've gone to the grocery store and like, oh, I forgot something or this is something was wrong with the product I purchased or they need to put it in my bag or whatever. What's the chance of me actually going back to the grocery store to complain about 99 cent bananas or something? You know, just I just don't do it. I just I just don't do it. Um, and we talk about some of the other marketing benefits here of you get the feedback and it also matches our the society's new way of obtaining information. Why is it that we don't have the morning and afternoon newspaper anymore? When I grew up, we had the Milwaukee Journal and the Milwaukee Sentinel. The Milwaukee Sentinel came at your door by 5.30 in the morning, and the journal was at your door by 5.30 p.m. And there's a lot of people that subscribe to both papers. My grandparents, they, their generation, they had both papers. They had the paper in the morning and the afternoon paper. What happens now? We get, we get, we get all our news how? Online. All right, TV. Um, there's a lot more news outlets that way now. Um, part of it was the problem with newspapers. They provide their content for free. Online and now they're trying to charge for it, and I just don't think it's it's going to work out for them. Quite honestly, uh, I knew someone who worked at the Kenosha News who said that they're not getting many people. Yeah, they said they're trying to charge just to go just to like own their website. Yeah, and so now I think there's X amount of if you go to Kenosha News website, you go in there and all you can read are the actual articles on the left hand side. If you want to get into any actual major content, you have to be a subscriber and they charge you like per day. Um, the Milwaukee Journal has one that supposedly limits you to 15 articles. So I always get the warning like you've exceeded 15 articles, but it always lets me go to the article. So I'm not sure <laughs> like if it's just like in their training mode now to get people used to it and then a couple months they're going to actually go to it. But papers really aren't seeing a a big influx because like USA Today 
has decided to go for this pay for article type of scenario. Challenge is, okay, USA Today shuts down their news service. You know what? I'm going to NBCNews.com. I'm going to CNN.com. I'm going to other avenues for that where, you know, growing up, we got our news from one or two spots. It was reading the paper or the NBC Nightly News or the ABC Nightly News. I mean, it came on at 5.30. Like, that was a big... That was a big deal. And now those nightly news programs and the newspapers, there's just so much other avenues for us to get information. And I can get that information rather quickly. And I can be very I can be much more focused on it. Yeah, there's sometimes where they have a like a news hook, you know, on on a certain news uh, broadcast where they say someone so and so got into a fight or whatever. I then I go to the internet and find out what they were talking okay. about before they even bring it up. Um how much time like if if there's so I remember there was a major news thing that happened when I was just out of high school, I think. And it was O.J. Simpson. All right? And I remember I worked at Wisconsin State Fair at the time, and everyone was huddled around the TV set watching the O.J. I think the one that when we were there, when I, what I'm thinking about is when they had the verdict. It might have been with the verdict, where everyone was huddled around the TV to watch this. All right. Now, how do we? Now, if there's a breaking news story, all right? Not too long ago, we had the um, school shooting, Sandy Hook. Um, I found out about that on Twitter, actually. All right. Once first reports started coming in, what I actually ended up did, I went to the auto store that day, like the dealer, and they were watching some of this is school shooting in. New Hampshire or whatever, you know. Like, I didn't think too much of it in Connecticut. I'm like, oh, okay. It just, I just saw it in the news. I didn't realize that it was, like, as big of a deal as it was until I got home when I went online. And then I could get live news coverage feeds of what was going on. I mean, there's so now if there's a story happening, people are going online to get that information. That's how, that's how news is now being disseminated. And so CNN, those type of, they're giving live feeds. They're really giving people a reason not to go to the TV. I mean, that's, that's ultimately uh, what's happening. And so blogs buy into that piece of if I'm a company or if I, am heavy, if I have my own blog, I don't have to do a lot to go through my web developer to get something put up. I can just, boom, here's a story, hit submit, and it's done, you know. And so when we look at uh, blogging strategy, we need to make sure that we have a strategy developed that's going to make this blog successful. And the first thing, one of the statistics that they had in the book, 50% of blogs are abandoned within 90 days of creation. And so what ends up happening is people really don't have a plan put together of how they're going to make this blog work. And so they might go in there, they set it up, they throw up one article, and they kind of forget about it or they don't schedule it as part of their regular activity or a day-to-day -day activity. This is something I have to do. I've got to make sure that I'm identifying to do three blog posts a day. You know, um, And that, that becomes the other challenge of, all right, I got Facebook, I'm supposed to be doing for my business. I've got Twitter now that's growing that I should be doing for my business. Now I've got blogs I'm supposed to be doing for my business. How do I make all of these pieces and components work together and be effective? And so it might be something of you need to have you need, really need to set this is where my information is going to be. All right. And so let's say all of your content is going to come from your blog. All right. Then you're going to say, hey, come out and see my newest post on XYZ in my blog. You might throw something up on Facebook. You might throw a 100-word abstract of your blog post on Twitter. And so you want to make sure that you're using the other social networks to pull people into that one piece. The challenge or the mistake some companies make is they're putting different content on all of their different social networks. 
And so you might have some content that's going to Facebook, some that's going to Twitter, and some that's going to your blog page. The challenge or the problem that you run into is your customers don't know where to go for certain pieces of information. You want to make sure that they're kind of under, that they're aware that all if, if, if I know I'm looking for something, I know it's going to come from this blog page. And the other social networks and stuff are going to feed into it or from it. But I want to make sure one place is going to have all that information. Because you're going to have some customers that use Facebook and some that don't. And so you're going to have some customers that use Twitter and some that don't. And so you want to make sure if they're looking specifically for your information, how do I set it up in a way where I reach everybody? Uh, your objectives. What are you trying to prove or, or do with this blog page? Is it to bring in more customers? Is it to bring out content? We're going to talk about how do we have a, you even need a content strategy. What is the topics that we should be talking about? What's the strategy we should be doing or looking at? And then ultimately, we need to be committed to it. We need to be committed to saying, I'm doing three a week, and at the end of the week, did I get my three this week? How did I do that? How well did I do it? And so always constantly on top of, of making the post, making sure that my page is as fresh as it possibly could be. And maybe a post could be pulling in saying, hey, there's a great new show or a great new topic here that I pulled up from another site. And so it might not just be something where a lot of times people feel like it's just content I have to create. It could just be sharing new content with your readers. Actually, that's something that I ran into because I was doing this all new episodes going ongoing. And so I started bringing in like a guest blogger to just write some stuff. And that actually was quite successful. Mm -hmm. So I'm venturing out into having other people. And it gives you more diversity. Yeah. It gives you more diversity because there's only so much stuff. Like for me, if I do a blog on marketing, there's only so much stuff I can write on marketing. There's so much stuff I can do. And so like for my online classes, we did a weekly message that uh, I'll show you later that is more produced than stuff we've done in the past. Like I'm doing video messages. It's almost like a weekly video blog. And so like one thing at the end of each one is going to be what I call I Spy Marketing, which is just story recent. In, in marketing. So the, the one we did this week was uh, Taylor Swift signing on with Diet Coke and what the, the purpose of, of their partnership is going to be. Uh, content strategy identifying who is the audience. Generally, we want to have a specific niche market that we're going to be going after. And so uh, who is it that we're we're identifying and going to this. We don't want to be, Walmart would never be successful at blogging. All right, Walmart would never be successful at blogging, right? Because you can buy milk, beer, and guns all in the same spot, right? And so we want to make sure, you realize that they are the number one retailer of firearms in the United States is Walmart. So like when the, when the president was having this big conversation about like, are we going to have gun control laws or whatever? Like Walmart was at the table because they sell more guns than any other retailer. It's crazy. Um, and so we want to have a niche market. Walmart's not a niche market, right? The benefit to Walmart is we've got anything you could possibly want at Walmart. All right? If it's not at Walmart, good chances of you may not, you, you may never be able to find it. You know, Walmart's one of those anomalies. In my uh, marketing classes, my sales classes, a lot of times in my introduction uh, discussion board posts online, I'll say, give me an example of a good shopping experience and give me an example of a bad shopping experience. Generally, 65 to 75% of my students will say they had a bad shopping experience at Walmart. Well, only a couple will say, like, I don't shop there anymore. And I don't believe the ones who say that they don't shop there. Like, it's... it's People are like okay with it being like bad because Walmart's not about customer service. It's about cheap and a lot of it, right? And so this is just the opposite. We want to be very specific, very targeted to a specific group. We want to be like the specialty retailer that only has X sizes in their store. You know, we don't want to be able to go and shop from small to 8X. You know, we don't want that. We want a very specific experience so we can target a very specific audience. 
And then is my unique, is my content unique, or am I just duplicating what someone else has? If I'm just duplicating what someone else has, chances are they're not going to come to me. You know, there's some people who have blogs because they're just, they're really just kind of talking to themselves in the cyber world. Right? They're just no one's really paying attention to them. They're just putting their stuff out. You know, that's why I don't go on Twitter because no one, you know, as I said before, people don't want to pay attention when I have to say in class. They really don't think they're going to follow me on Twitter. Like, oh, hey, I fell asleep during this class. I could go follow on Twitter. I just don't think that's happening, you know? And so what is it that is different about your content? Are you giving it a different twist? Are you humorous? What is it? Why would people follow your blog? Why, and, and ultimately, why would they believe anything you had to say? What validity are you bringing on what you have to say? Uh, general tips. First, you want to make sure that you're using catchy titles. You know, if I just put something on the title of marketing, it's not specific enough. People aren't going to really get into it. Um, and again, I cannot stress this idea of, of updating it, of making sure that the content is new. If you don't provide new content, people are not going to go to your, your site. Uh, you want to make sure that your posts are focused. They don't have to be war and peace. They don't have to be 10,000 words. You, know, you want to make sure that they're short and sweet, very specific, and... You know, if you want to get people's feedback, you want to leave it at a point where you're kind of letting people respond. Give them a way or an avenue to respond if that's, if you, that's what you're trying to elicit. Um, you want to make sure that if you want to get more people to come to your site, you want to invite comments. I find it that a lot of people don't use the blog. They go to the blog site, they read the information, then they go to Facebook page and then they start, you know, I asked somebody on my website what would they like the show to talk about. They post it on Facebook, gun restrictions, gun control, that's what they mm -hmm. should talk about. So, uh, so I'm noticing that, that Facebook is the, the place where people feel most safe to post. You know, and now there's new tools out there that uh, we're with a company we developed, their main company's website, mm -hmm. where we can have their posts, their Facebook posts, in a direct feed into the site. So in the front corner is actually like a, a running scroll of everything that's being talked about on Facebook, on their Facebook page. And you can set that up where you only show like, I only show the posts that they make. And so like I might say, today's special is potato soup. And so only that will show up. You can also set it up where people's comments will show up on the main page. And so you can do an RSS feed now from Facebook to your blog page. And so all those comments then, you know, going back to the idea of having one area where all your comments from all your social networks kind of combine into one area. And then a lot of blogs too, you can like, let's say you're on a website, you find a blog, you want to comment on something. You don't have to be part of that blog. A lot of them you can comment using your Facebook. Yeah. No, yeah. And so now you can log in through your Gmail account or your Facebook page. There's a lot of applications that are doing that. It's really what kind of sustained Twitter is. Once they had that instant connection now with Facebook, Twitter's kind of grown beyond that. Uh, how do you promote it? What are you doing to promote your blog? How are you getting it out there? Um, when you make a post, generally I'll ask you like what the topics are. And that's what we call meta tags. You want to make sure that you're tagging it properly. And so even like when I do, so really think of YouTube, kind of like a video blog um, for all intents and purposes. Um, I make sure that when I put my tags in there, I try to be specific. Uh, one thing I always put in the tag is I always put my name in the tag. And so if I tell students, hey, you can see the video on my YouTube channel, they can go to YouTube and type my name. And hopefully, sooner or later, it'll get to me. Uh, there is a guy who is a like computer programmer who always shows up first. Uh, but if you see if you've seen me before, it's pretty clear I'm not that guy. Um, so that's one way to promote it. And then what titles I put in there. And so 
if it's on, you know, I, I try to be more specific and just say marketing. So if I'm talking about strategic planning, I'll put marketing, strategic planning. I might do uh, SWOT. If we're talking like SWOT analysis. I might, you can put, generally put as many tags as you possibly can. And so that's what's going to make it more searchable, the more tags that you put in there. What are you doing to engage your users? Are you getting them to make this thing interactive to them? And it could be the topic. Um, you know, you can engage them by creating negativity. What is why? Well, why do you think they said avoid negativity? What do you, What do you mean, like avoid you yourself projecting negativity, or avoid like? People leave, leave the well, you can't really do that. I mean, you, yeah. you what I mean, you being negative may create that. Um, you know, one of the things with blogs, a lot of times we can be anonymous. So anything that becomes political in nature is going to create a lot of comments. Uh, right now, you know, if I if I created a blog page and I said, "Man, we need to get rid of all guns," all right? If I say, "Hey, we need to get rid of all guns." And I'm really negative about it, like, hey, all these people are, you know, but not saying, not having a dialogue, just being really negative about people on that other side of that argument. What's going to happen to those comments? It's going to turn into a big argument. Right. You're going to, it's going to certain, there's certain topics that you know are going to start an argument. Now, you can do that in a way where, hey, I want to have conversation. I want to bring in a lot of people into my blog page. And we're going to bring that conversation out. Now, there's ways you can say it without, you know, offending people because that's when your, your blog page might get out of control, you know, uh, and you might be targeted by different groups that are just going to inundate your blog page with comments and you're never going to get around it. Um, you want to make sure that you stand by your content. And so you want to be, if you're going to take a stance that you generally you're going to, to keep with that stance. Um, and are there ways for you to cross promote other blogs? And so maybe you say, hey, so and so had a post in their blog and link to them. And maybe you start to create where you're, you're sending traffic to other blogs, they're going to reciprocate and send traffic to your page. Um, 